Welcome to Find Ability University. Um, my name is Heather Lexi, and today we have one of my dearest friends and social media expert, Corey Perlman. Corey has been, how long have you been in this industry now? 10 plus years. That makes us a little uh, dinosaurish in our space. Um, but uh, I'm thrilled Corey has a new book called Social Media Overload. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Um, and I am thrilled to have him on today. He's going to walk us through how to really streamline and, you know, how to avoid social media overload and, the, you know, so seven social media must for businesses today. So I'm going to go ahead. Thank you for understanding on the uh, issue with your meeting. Sometimes you just never know what you can get. But I'm going to hand over to Corey, and he's going to walk us through uh, his take on social media and what do we really need to be engaging in and what can we ignore. So I'm going to give over to Corey. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. And, again, we apologize, everybody. We know your time is extremely valuable and uh, don't like to have technical difficulties there, but uh, glad that we finally were able to get you on. And again, this will be recorded, so feel free to take notes, but we'll make sure you get the uh, recording here. Uh, you know, as Heather knows, uh, as a speaker, especially in this industry, you're supposed to get a book out every, uh, they say, uh, 12 to 18 months. And I wrote my first book in 2009, and I, I didn't write this book until 2014. So I, uh, I was way behind, six years, five years, whatever that is. I'm getting my second book out, but I didn't want to write something until I had something to say. And I was in a presentation recently, and I had a guy run up to me, uh, sweating, all, all uh, flustered, and he said, Corey, I really need you to be able to get uh, my Twitter feed syndicated to my website. And I said, okay, I can help you do that. We can do that at the end of this presentation, but tell me a little bit more about your business. He told me he sold medical supplies to the elderly. And there was a moment of sort of zen there between he and myself where we just looked at each other and he just had this moment of clarity that said, wait a second, do I need to be focused on Twitter? And I said, I don't think you do, man. I'm not sure your audience is on Twitter. And maybe you need to push that one aside and maybe focus on the areas that might actually generate uh, results. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today, social media overload. I'm going to go through very quickly seven social media musts that I think will have a major impact on your business this year and beyond. Uh, feel free to type in your questions. You guys have obviously gotten very familiar with the question uh, panel there telling us that you couldn't hear us earlier, so feel free to write in questions, and every once in a while, I'll click on that button there and see if you have any questions, but please do chime in and let us know, and uh, we'll get going here. So here we go. Uh, that's the book, by the way, Social Media Overload. Those are my two kids. Uh, we did a, uh, a big blast campaign to keep Grandpa off of Twitter. I told them that if it became an Amazon bestseller, that we would keep my father, who's retired and very comfortable, off of Twitter. And uh, we were able to do that because it became an Amazon bestseller. So that's fantastic. So uh, I'll tell you towards the end I didn't get the book. And we got a few copies that we're going to give away for free. Uh, we'll tell you how to do that towards the end of the recording. Okay, let's skip that one, skip that one. Okay, so here we go. So the, the goal, obviously, is instead of being a jack of all social media sites, master of none, we're going to focus on a few areas that can truly generate results. So I don't want you to be on every social media site. Now, it might be Twitter, it might be Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. The whole point is, is taking a step back, taking a deep breath, and saying, where are my clients and customers and prospects hanging out online? Let's meet them there instead of trying to be everywhere. And that's really what we're focused on. So I really want you to focus on the area that can actually truly generate results. Uh, if you're taking notes this might be, or, or tweeting, this might be the first thing you may want to write down. Uh, but just kind of a mantra that, that we at eBootCamp, which is my company, we live by. If you're not generating results with social media, it's just a hobby. If you're not generating results with social media, it's just a hobby. So if you can't tell me that you're gaining leads or uh, creating engagement or some type of thing like that, then um, then that that's a challenge. And Joseph, you, I see a question on here that says no sound. Hopefully, uh, is everybody else still able to hear me okay? Uh, just go ahead and put that question box if everybody can hear me clearly. Hopefully, uh, we're still good to go here. Okay, thank you, Ant. thank you, Andrew. Okay, so uh, but when I talk about results, a lot of people just focus on generating leads, and I want to show you this is kind of the flux capacitor for you Back to the Future fans out there uh, of my book, and this is the inverted pyramid, and and I just want to show you these different layers of results that we look for for our clients. The first one at the top is generate leads. That's what everybody wants. Uh, you know, more web traffic, uh, more emails, you know, more opt-ins, that type of thing. But that's only the first layer. The second layer is building credibility. Once they find out about you, 
how do you make sure that you're keeping their credibility or increasing your credibility instead of diminishing it? Social media plays a huge part of that, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, staying top of mind is another area that you, is a result that we look for. If somebody meets you in January, they may not do business with you until October. So how do you stay top of mind with them? That's a really critical piece to social media that a lot of people miss when they are uh, working on their social media marketing. Driving people to your sweet spot, that's the number one mistake I see businesses make, is not driving people to their sweet spot. Instead, they're trying to sell on Facebook or Twitter or one of the social media sites. If you build roofs for a living uh, and you repair roofs, your sweet spot is not Facebook. It's on top of that roof with the customer, showing them where the area is and how to fix it. That's your sweet spot. So whatever business you're in, you got to figure out where your sweet spot is and drive people there instead of trying to sell on social media. Now, once they become a client, you can build relationships with social media. It's one of the major areas that we use on social media uh, is strengthening relationships. So it's easier to keep a customer than to gain a new one. So how do we make sure that our customers are hearing from us more than just when it's invoice time? If they're just hearing from you when it's billing time, that's a problem. How do you strengthen those relationships? And there's some great digital channels you can use to do that. And then finally, my favorite is earning referrals. Making sure that your customer base is your sales force. How do you get them talking about you through these digital channels? And that's really what social media is all about. It's, it's, it's word of mouth on steroids. And that's really, really important. So that's kind of the area that, um, that we're going to focus on today. Check out the questions here, sir. Okay, so number one, you must fish where the fish are. So I've already kind of mentioned that before, but I want you to pull the car over. I want you to stop what you all are doing, and I want you to think about where your customers and prospects are spending time online. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, you can survey them. You could use something like SurveyMonkey, and you could send an email out to all your existing clients and say, hey, here are the top five sites that we know, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. Which of these do you use most frequently? You're going to get some data right there. You can ask people when they walk into your store, when you see your clients, you know, how often are you on Twitter? Do you use Facebook? Start to get an idea of whether or not they are actively on these sites and then start to prioritize the sites that you're using. And you may decide that you might completely drop a couple of sites. And I have no problem with that, especially if your clients and customers are ignoring that site themselves. Uh, number two is you must be searchable. Now, of course, this is Heather's field. Um, don't need to spend too much time on that. You probably are very uh, good with, with this information, but there's a couple areas that I always make sure people are focused on when it comes to Google. I want to make sure that you're not a Google ghost town when people are kicking your tires, because we still know that when people start their research process, they're going to Google. And the question is, are they finding you? So uh, I'm showing you a quick anatomy of a search engine. Most of you obviously are very clear on this, but you've got your advertising, you, where I have the blue area, right the blue arrow, right below that you have your organic listings, and right below that you have your Google local business page. If you're a brick and mortar, you really want to pay attention to what I'm about to talk about. If you're a physical location, you really want to pay attention to what I'm about to talk about because this could dramatically increase your business. So that's pretty much the anatomy that we're going to go through here. Um, when I talk about uh, Google advertising, I talk about uh, people always asking, when should I advertise? I always say when you don't show up. So I'll give you an example, a quick example of that. I have a uh, video production company that we work with. They rank very well for video production Ferndale, Michigan, but they rank very poorly for video production Detroit, Michigan. So I recommend that they advertise on Detroit where they're not ranking well because they're not physically located there and not necessarily advertise on Ferndale where they rank really well organically. So our typical strategy is if you're not showing up in the top page of, of your Google results, it's a good opportunity to advertise uh, and, and pay a little bit of money to Google, okay? Yeah, and by the way, that's, that's Heather's world, so make sure you, you visit her on that. Uh, but I want to talk about Google local business pages. So again, those A, B, C listings that you see at the very bottom, there, such a critical area. This is where people do a lot of their research, and you can either be building credibility here or losing it depending upon what they see. So uh, we're going to skip this for now, skip, 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 skip sorry. Uh, Google local business page. So an important piece of online real estate. It's often viewed more times than your website, and people trust these pages because they're on Google. They think if it's on Google, it must be true, even though you have just as much opportunity to update these pages as you do your own website. And people make decisions based on the reviews that they see on this page. So let me show you what they're looking like. So again, just to be clear, 
somebody does a search, any kind of search with a geographical location on Google, 99 out of 100 times they're going to see these Google local listings, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? Then they click on one of these pages and they see something like this. This is a very blank, boring, doing nothing for you page that many of you right now have your page looking just like this. No picture, no information, nothing. You, you didn't even know it existed. Whereas if you do a little work on it, it can look something like this. So now you've got images, you've got some uh, info that's been updated by the business owner, and you've got some reviews below. And this can help you start to build that credibility. You can tell people the type of services that you offer when you're open, your contact information. Uh, you can even have videos on this page. You can really spruce it up and give yourself that uh, boost in credibility when people are kicking your tires online. All right, so the first thing I want you to do is find your Google local business page, claim it, and update it. Get it looking nice. That's half the battle. The second half, of course, is getting those reviews. Now, here's the challenge. Number three is you must be proactive in getting positive reviews because people are much more motivated when they're unhappy than when they're happy. We all know that. When somebody's upset, they'll run through the Internet and they'll talk about us. But when they're happy, they're not as anxious to do that. So we need to request. Just today, I had a speaking gig uh, out in Virginia Beach, and I went on LinkedIn, and I requested a recommendation from the meeting planner because we need to do that. When we do a good job, we need to ask for the recommendation or the testimonial. In this case, when you guys are you know, providing a great product, somebody says, you know, i got to tell you, um, you know, thank you for helping us find a home. You, know, you were the greatest real estate agent that we've ever had. It's a great opportunity for you to say, hey, would you, buy, would you mind either going to my LinkedIn profile or my Google Plus page and writing us a review? It would really be helpful to me. It's the best way you can say thank you. Be proactive in getting reviews. Because i got to tell you, as you can see on the screen here, some of them are downright nasty. In this particular review, somebody took three and a half hours to write the scathing review, and at the very end, they actually said that the business hates puppies. So if that tells you anything, man, not only did they criticize the business, but they actually said that how could anyone hate puppies, but they actually said at the very end, this business also hates puppies. So people are, people are crazy. I'm going to um, stop for a second here and just look at the questions if I can get my little arrow here. Okay. Okay, so Joseph is having some challenges with yeah, the chat. Can, can you mention, uh, make Molly a moderator? Yes, let me make sure to make Molly a moderator. Okay. Uh, screen share. Screen yes. um, okay. share. Give us one second. We're going to make Molly. Okay. Make the no, no, no. Make make organized. Organized. Okay. Okay. Go okay. Going back to my presentation. Sorry. We just want to make sure everybody can hear and see us without problems. Okay. And Joe, if you're out there, we're going to try to help you out. Maybe. Uh... Okay, so here are a couple different ways that you can ask for positive reviews. I, my best practice here is to make sure you do it when, strike when the iron's hot, meaning um, if you are, let's say, a massage place or something, right after that person gets the massage, that's the time to ask for the review. Don't wait for two or three days because they're stressed again, you know. Uh, so make sure you do it right when they when when they get the product or utilize the service. Uh, you can also send an email blast out to customers, and also uh, social media is also very helpful. Uh, Facebook pages, you know, is a great place to ask for reviews as well. As you can see here, this if you went to Hood Canal Communications and you were kicking their tires online, you saw all these nice reviews about their business. Um, that's a very nice way to build some credibility. So again. Uh, I recommend that you you um, you go to Facebook and do that. And what was this one? Well, my question is, how do you add the review? Well, they add them themselves. So Richard Williams would actually come to Facebook and write the review on your Facebook page. You want to make sure that you tell your customers where to go on your page to write the review. You wouldn't write these yourself. You would have your customer come and author the review themselves. Make sure you thank them when they do it, too. All right, so take action. Claim that Google page. Make sure it's claimed. Um, update your info and ask for reviews. Ask for reviews. Very, very critical. All right, number four, you must have a professional mobile-friendly website. Now, I spoke at a uh, motorcycle conference uh, six months ago, and when I walked in the lobby, I saw the most beautiful bikes in the world. They were absolutely spectacular. Then I walked in my room, and I saw a website that looked like this. 
And that's got to tell you something right after that. They're not consistent with their offline quality and their online quality. We've got to change that. We've got to make sure that I'm going to assume that your products and services are fantastic. I want to make sure your website and your other social media sites reflect that same quality. you got to have a dynamic, nice-looking site. So here are a couple ways to make sure you do that. Watch out for color pollution. Watch out for too much images and not enough content. Watch out for not having your critical information above the fold and no opt-in box. And I'm going to go through each of these right now. So number one, color pollution. This is color pollution. You're seeing it on your screen. If you see three or more primary colors, that's color pollution. Too much. Makes your head start to spin. You want to have three colors or less complementing each other. Make it simple. Make it easy for the person to navigate your site. Don't put too much stuff on there. Any animation and all that stuff that starts in 1997, don't do that. This is an accountant's website. And if you're a client of an accountant and you're going to a website, 99 out of 100 times you're looking for their phone number. And I will challenge you to look on this homepage and try to find those num that phone number. You won't find it. So whatever is most critical to your customers and prospects on your website, put it in an easy place where they can find it. Don't make them search. Do not make them search for critical content. And then A, B, C, E. One of the most important things I'll tell you today, always be collecting email addresses. Failure equals when a prospect visits your site and leaves without giving you their information. So make sure you are actively asking for the contact information from your prospect that visits your site. So you'll see an example. Here's my site. On the bottom left, we are giving away a boatload of resources in exchange for your name and email so that I can take control of that relationship. Doesn't mean I'm going to spam you. Doesn't mean I'm going to overdo it. But I want to at least be able to touch base with you and follow up with you and see if you might be right for, for our products or services. And I'd like you to do the same thing as well. And then last but not least, don't forget to mobilize your site. Um, uh, we used to recommend this. Now we demand it. Uh, you don't want to just shrink your site down. You actually want to make it mobile responsive. If you haven't done that, this is a quick free resource, due to mobile.com. They have a free version and a paid version. Uh, you can see it on the site right there. It's like a car wash. They take it in your website and they spit it out mobile, and it's great. It's, very, it's easy to use, and that's something you can do short-term and get it done. But over time, you want to utilize, again, a service maybe that Heather offers or somebody else where they can actually go into your code and make it mobile responsive so the site knows if somebody's visiting you on a website or a mobile device and they actually change it to make it thumb friendly, as, as Heather likes to talk about. Okay? All right, number five. Let's go over here and check out the questions and make sure we're. Uh, anybody have any questions on anything we've covered so far? Get my arrow over here. That'll do that. So we're on number five. But write your questions if you have any questions. And if you want to, uh, yeah, if you're having any issues, feel free to message Molly. She's now a uh, organizer on the on the program as well. Number five of the seven, we're we're downhill here. So stay with us. You must be proud of your profile. So like I said earlier, people are kicking your tires, not just your website, but also your social media sites. So let me give you a couple of ways to be careful of this. Are you scaring people off? That's the big question. Nothing kills credibility faster than untouched profile. Nothing kills credibility faster than an untouched profile. So what I want you to think about is not letting your site die on the vine. What I want you to do is I want you to take inventory of everything that your company has out online. And if anything is not being managed, you either need to start managing it or get rid of it. If you've got a YouTube channel with six views, cut it. If you've got a LinkedIn profile with 11 connections, manage it or get rid of it. But it's doing you more harm than good. If somebody goes to your LinkedIn profile, there's no picture, there's no information, and you've got three connections or 12 connections, or 25 connections. Make sure you're managing it. Numbers matter. You want to have a, you know, you want to be proactive in building your connections on whatever site you're using. If you're using a Facebook fan page, get likes. If you're using a LinkedIn personal page, get connections. Doesn't mean you got to overdo it. Uh, if you're a restaurant, you don't need 25,000 sites. If you're a local restaurant, you might need only 1,000 or 500. Just make sure you're being proactive in getting numbers. How to build your numbers. If you send an email blast out right now, if you have 67 fans, that'll take you to 167 in no time. Uh, you can promote it by spending a little money on Facebook to build your numbers if that's what you're trying to accomplish. You can use your website. You can use your email signature. Every time you send an email, you can say, hey, you know, we're offering some great incentives on our Facebook page. Feel free to join us there, and you can run some content. 
but just be proactive in building your numbers. Very important. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your LinkedIn profile. It's a very important place. It's an easy place for people to be able to check you out. They don't have to friend you. They can go over here and just check you out before they meet with you. And I'd rather you, again, uh, give them a warm and fuzzy feeling about you than to turn them off for some reason. So let me give you a couple easy things you can do. One is have a nice professional current photo of yourself. Uh, the worst thing you can do is have no photo at all. That concerns people. So make sure you don't do that. Those are numbers. Uh, 500 plus connections, great place to be. I don't need you to get thousands of people that you've never heard of before, but if you're active on uh, expanding your network of people that you know on LinkedIn, you'll get those numbers up very quickly. Big best practice or big mistake I see on profiles. This is not a resume. Unless you're looking for a job, your LinkedIn profile is not a resume. So don't tell people what you did 23 years ago uh, right out of college. Nobody cares. Give me the five reasons I should be doing business with you. Give me the five benefits to doing business with you. Talk in terms of my interest on your profile. Uh, you can also add video and pictures now to your uh, summary, which is really cool. So if you're a speaker, let's say, and you happen to be on the call, having you speaking is great. Uh, if you're a real estate agent, you might have pictures of some of the homes that you have for sale, whatever the case may be. And last but not least, recommendation. Get quality recommendation. I recommend quality recommendations instead of quantity. So I don't want you getting 50 recommendations. I want you to get 7 to 10 for people that um, have actually done business with you and want to hear from you. Yeah, a question that I'm often asked about this is endorsements. Endorsements versus recommendations. Well, let me, let me uh, uh, acknowledge that really quickly. Endorsements is just a check that you do a certain skill. And people ask me if those are important. And I think they are, not right now necessarily, but down the road. I think if somebody searches for social media or social media expert on LinkedIn and Heather has 25 people who have checked the box for her on social media and I have 24 people, she's going to show up before I will. So having people um, endorse you for a skill set may help in your ranking down the road for LinkedIn. So I do think it's important. I think recommendations are more important. The recommendations are written recommendations that people can give you. Yeah, uh, Heather also asked about uh, paying for the premium service of LinkedIn. My recommendation on that is don't pay for the premium until you start actively using LinkedIn and they start dead ending you. What I mean by that is you're doing a certain feature on LinkedIn and they say, oh, sorry, Heather, can't do that anymore unless you upgrade. It's a good time to think about upgrading. What I hate to see is you start paying 50 bucks a month and then uh, not using the services that are free, and you're just wasting money. So once you start getting dead-ended by LinkedIn, it's a good time to upgrade. Okay, so. And I'll take your questions. Um, I, if you have any questions, please write them, and then I promise to take them at the end, and we will have time. Um, where are we done at? Three o'clock? Okay, we're good. Okay, I only got two more left, and these are really good ones. So um, if you stay till the end here, you'll be happy you did. Number six is you must build trust trust through social media. So if you remember that inverted uh, pyramid that I showed earlier, we're on the point now that once they become a um, customer of yours, social media is a great way to build that relationship. And this is going to be a little controversial for some of you. Um, if you're a doctor or a a lawyer or a dentist, what I'm about to share would absolutely not work for you. But if you're like in my business or in Heather's business or in a business of having long-term clients, um, this might be something that will work really well for you. So just pay attention, and then if it doesn't work, you can throw it away, no problem. So quick activity. I want you to really quickly write down one to three of your VIP clients. So write down the names of one, two, or three clients that either pay you the most money, have been with you the longest, uh, you just love working with whatever the case may be. Just write somebody's name down. Even if you work with a company, write down the decision maker's name. Then I want you to write down uh, their birthday, when they uh, were born, when they have their birthday every year. I want you. <laughs> I want you to write down the distinctions. Heather's heckling me over here. Uh, I want you to write down the distinctions that you. We are together, by the way. Heather and I are actually. I live in Atlanta. She lives in Denver, but we're actually here together. Uh, doing this. It's fun. What distinctions do you know about these clients? Awards, achievements, what would they hang in their office if you were walking into their office right now? Uh, what are their hobbies? What are their favorite sports teams? What do they like to do when they're not working? These are things that are very important to your customers and that we all really should know about our VIP clients. 
What are they passionate about? What are they passionate about? Uh, what do they wake up every morning thinking about us? About? And do you connect with them on a weekly basis? So again, that question of are they hearing from you when there's a problem or an invoice is due, or are they hearing from you on an ongoing basis? Let me really quickly tell you about one of my largest clients, Mary Stevenson. Her birthday is May 11th. She just celebrated her 10th year of being smoke-free, so I sent her a personal note, uh, cigarette-free, about I know the power of that addiction. My, my mom um, died of lung cancer 10 years ago. I know uh, how, how terrible that addiction is, so the fact that she's been 10 years running is, is fantastic. Wrote her a nice letter. She's a huge Alabama Crimson Tide fan, so I thanked her. I'm a Florida State Seminole for uh, taking a year off and letting us win the national championship last year. Uh, the Bible is her favorite book. That's what she's passionate about. She just became a grandmother for the first time, so she's also very passionate about her granddaughter. We actually compare cuteness photos of her granddaughter and my daughter, Talia. Now, there's my daughter, Talia. Hopefully, you will all agree that it's pretty darn cute. Um, I think I win, but who knows. And uh, she and I interact with each other on a weekly basis. She's also one of my largest clients and pays us well over five figures every year. So the question, of course, is how do I know all this about her? And Heather um, beat me to the punch and said, you can know all that on Facebook. Facebook, and she's absolutely right. Uh, but specifically, I am personally friends with Mary on Facebook. That is how I know this information about her. It's not that I asked her about it. It's just that it comes up during uh, my relationship with her on Facebook. She shares pictures. She shares accomplishments. I see her birthday on the right. There's just that common, ongoing interaction that I have with her via that vehicle. Now, do I use it in a sneaky, strategic way? Absolutely not. Um, when I like something on her page, it's because I really like it. When she likes something on my page because she really likes it. I'm only friends with her on Facebook because I actually actually like her and she likes me and we're friends. Um, so if this is something that you have been concerned about, it might be an opportunity to rethink it. Now, I recognize the challenges. You have to filter yourself. Uh, there are plenty of times that I want to vent on Facebook. Heather and I were talking about this last night. I don't do it because for fear that I am going to put off my client. Um, but I'm okay with that because the advantages for me far outweigh the distance. And that's why I like to be personally connected with my VIP clients on Facebook. A question I'm often asked about this is, Corey, what if I had one page for business, one page for personal, two personal pages? You can do that, but here are the two challenges. That's twice the work, and you're going to have business contacts try to friend you on your personal page, and you're going to have to have that conversation with them on moving them over to the business page. So if you're okay with that, go for it. If not, I either recommend allowing your business contacts in or not. Now, if you decide to let them in, be very, very, very uh, careful and be very um, uh, knowledgeable about the privacy settings on Facebook. For example, if you're afraid that a college friend is going to tag you with a not-so-good photo, make it so that Facebook emails you and alerts you that someone has tried to tag you and that that will not go on your page until you approve it. You can do that. Um, that way you don't have to worry about that. So, um, so there are some privacy settings that you can do to limit the concern you might have for, um, for strangers or people from your past putting stuff up that you're not too proud of. Okay. All right. Last but not least, uh, my last and my favorite social media strategy of all time is uh, letting your customers sell for you. So the power in LinkedIn is not your network. It's your network's network. What I mean by that is, it's great that you know 350 people on LinkedIn, but the power of LinkedIn from a business standpoint is who those people know. And how do you, how do you take a cold call and turn it into a warm lead? And I'm going to show you how to do that because what happened with me was when I started in this business, we had a cold call. Heather and I had to spend a lot of time on the phone. And I hate cold calling more than life itself. I can't stand it. I can't stand talking about myself and bragging. It just feels very uncomfortable for me. So I wanted to find a better way. So I'll show you how I did it. Uh, this is a way to get introduced to decision makers on LinkedIn. So I did a search, a company search, uh, and I typed in Los Angeles. I went to the search bar on LinkedIn. You can type in anything. You can type in an industry. You can type in a city. You can type in a state. You can type in a, a company name, whatever you want to do. But I typed in a city because I was traveling to that city. And I found AEG Entertainment, the company I wanted to do business with. I've never done business with them. I don't know anybody in the world that knows anybody. I just started from scratch, totally cold. I clicked on their little company link, and they tell me all kinds of things about AEG, including, which is so nice of LinkedIn, all of their decision makers. So right off the bat, I can totally bypass the gatekeeper 
and, and see, I'll look at all these people that LinkedIn tells me, corporate and premium sales, director, vice president, vice president, director. Tell me those aren't decision makers. Tell me those people can't make decisions and write checks for the company. They probably can't. Okay, so my person in particular here is the vice president of sales and marketing, Michael Casa. So what I'm looking for is that magic number two. When I see that number two, it means that they know someone that I know. In this big old goofy world, all these decision makers know someone in my network that I know. So I want to explore that. So I'm going to click on Michael's name. And I'm going to look at his profile and I'm going to learn a little bit about Michael. But most importantly, over at the bottom there, it tells me that I know Jeff Bryce because I'm connected to him. And Michael is also connected to Jeff. Holy cow. Now I can decide if Jeff is a good person to introduce me to Michael. And he is because I've done business with Jeff. So I call or email Jeff and I say, Jeff, hope all is well. I'm looking to be introduced to Michael Casa. Looks like you guys are connected. How are you connected? Oh, he used to work for our company, Corey. We're good friends. I'd be happy to do that. So Jeff sends an email, copies me to Michael, and says, hey, man, you got to meet this dude. He's written this best-selling book, great speaker. He says all the things that I feel very uncomfortable saying about myself, and he just turned a very, very frigid cold call into a beautiful, warm lead. And I cannot tell you how many people I have worked with who have utilized this particular strategy to earn business, and I hope it works for you too. And two quick caveats on that, and I'm going to open up this question. One is, you don't ask Jeff for the intro if you are not closely connected with Jeff. If you barely know him, don't ask for the introduction. And if Jeff says, sorry, Corey, I barely know Michael, I will not ask for the intro. The, the relationship has to work on both ways in order for me to ask for the introduction. Okay? And um, that is very important. So uh, we're going to skip over that, skip over that, skip over that. And um, pop, pop, pop. In summary, fish where the fish are. Don't get bad out of shape over social media. Uh, focus on a few and do them really well. Uh, if you over-promote, you're doing it, it's wrong because it's not a billboard. <laughs> uh, so make sure you're not overselling. Drive them to your sweet spot. Add value into your social media site. And um, be creative. So you want to be able to stand above the noise. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're doing Facebook or you're using LinkedIn as a strategy, find ways to deliver value in a unique way. Because the challenge that we all have is there's so much noise out there. How do you stand above it? And my answer to that is the more you can add value and help people, the more they will become uh, a tribe members of yours. And that's a fantastic way of being able to help. And keep it simple. And what I mean by that is don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. Uh, just you know, think of your top five most frequently asked questions that you're asked in a given week and answer those questions on your social media site. And that's a really good start in terms of delivering value to your network. Okay, um, this is my information. Um, if you liked what you heard, the thing I would ask you to do is buy the book. That would be a great thing that um, you could do. Huh? Yes, I will do that too. Um, but go to Amazon, buy the book. It's uh, socialmediaoverload.com is the website, um, and you can get it on Amazon. Um, if you if you uh, buy it, email me and let me know you bought it. I'm going to send you some free bonuses from, from some of my favorite authors that were kind enough, including Heather, uh, to give me a bunch of brief, free bonuses, Eric Qualman, uh, Jay Bear, a bunch of other people. And I'm also going to be speaking at Heather's event uh, in October, probably October 2nd or 3rd. Um, I will be speaking at her uh, findability Profits Lab in Denver. Be there. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be crazy. With that said, if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you. Please um, type it in on the chat. There you can raise your hand or we can we can open up the phone line. Maybe uh, Molly, you can open up the phone line. Let me come over here. So if you raise your hand. So raise your hand. Oh, here you go. Hold on one second. All right, thank you. Uh, aren't his slides great? I love the hot dog and the coffee. That was my personal favorite. Um, so what I'm wondering is, if you have a question on the console on the right, on the left hand side of the little hand, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand, and then I'll be able to um, see that you raised your hand. We'll unmute your line, and you can ask the question directly to Corey. Um, he is a wealth of resources and has just any social media site that you have a specific question on or wondering whether you should engage or not. So if you um, want to go ahead and raise your hand, I'll see you in the um, attendee list. And then I can go ahead. So Phil, uh, Pete has a question. So go ahead. Hey, 
Okay. Okay, Pete, we're going to open up your phone line first. Yeah, he's talking about LinkedIn. Oh, there you go. Let's put that Pete. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Just unmute his line. Yeah, he was saying uh, Pete, can you hear me? Pete, enter pound one one nine pound. Then I can then I can ask questions from you. Okay, is there someone else? Yeah, sure. Well, he's uh, uh, I'm going to answer Lisa's question about TripAdvisor. I don't really have anything specifically on how to say number one, but what I will say about these other third-party directories is um, what I do is do your most common Google searches that you need to rank for. Whatever directories rank highest are the ones that I pay attention to. So if TripAdvisor is high up there, then pay attention to them. And if you need to spend some money with them for advertising, great. Um, whatever you need to do to play by the rules, play by the rules. But I will say, if, if sure. bluepages.com comes to you and says, hey, you need to do this, this, and this, and this to get in our directory, and you do Google searches, and they don't show up, I don't see why you're... Okay, so... Uh, yeah, so here's Pete. We're still waiting, Pete. Uh, Pete, if you want to type your question in, uh, feel free. And then a follow-up question from Lisa is, do you think position on TripAdvisor is influenced by advertisers? I'm not 100% sure with TripAdvisor. Um, I've heard rumor that with Yelp that is indeed the case, uh, but I don't know with TripAdvisor. I, I can't answer that. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew. Glad you enjoyed it, man. Thanks for bearing with us uh, on the on TD. Like family and Pete, or, uh, here we go. Not sure what happened. Audio. Does Google value one social media channel more than another? Good question. You know, and Heather may have an opinion on this as well. Um, I would say that they value Facebook first. Obviously, they're competitors, but they have to. When they go from a, um, a, a Google Juice standpoint, Facebook still gets the largest traffic of any social network in the world, so they have to give credit where credit is due. So I find, uh, generally speaking, Facebook gets top, top bill. Now, with that being said, Google, of course, is going to um, bend the rules as much as they can for their own social network. So both Heather and I are on Google Plus as a social network only because, not because I think any of you are actively on it, because I really don't, but more importantly because I think it's going to work well for me on a, social, on a uh, search engine perspective or on a spe specific Google perspective. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? That um, you know, there was an announcement I think that came out yesterday or the day before yesterday about the fact that Google is no longer be going is going to be uh, using Google authorship, which was something that I was very excited about for quite a long time. And some of you may have set up 